I'm here today to talk about our Schools and Land program and the initiatives we have going on to identify how our schools are related to our land use issues and how our land use planning is affecting our school finances and our school location choices. If I can get this right. Apparently not. <laughs> That's working now. This one wasn't working, but All right, I'll figure it I can out. work it out in that later. <laughs> the reason we started this project is because obviously everyone here knows uh, the importance of our land and our land use issues, how it's tied to our economic growth, both our housing costs, our food and energy costs, um, but a little less known is how it possibly relates to how our schools are impacted um, as far as the number of population that's brought into an area, schools are financed and things like that. And the location and placement of our critical assets across our landscape schools being one of those is critical to our future economic development and our new economy growth. It's just one of those many assets and we wanted to investigate it a little bit further. And communities need to understand these connections if they're going to make wise decisions for the future growth of our regions. And we have begun this critical assets work is what we kind of call it. Um, for several years. And in fact, today, I believe Soji Elijah will be coming to the Grand Rapids region to do one of our initiation, which is our um, training programs that we're doing across the state, and it's our prosperity initiative. It's a two hour training to really um, provide a baseline information for everybody to learn what's going on with the economy, what are our critical assets, where do we need to go, what are the issues that we need to be dealing with at a regional and local level and a statewide level to help our growth in the future. And th those will be today, those are free. If you haven't seen them, check out our website. They're free to everyone. I highly encourage you to go. It's a series of three training programs. The first one is today. The second um, series, 201 and 301, start in about two weeks. Um, they're well worth your time and effort. And again, they're all free, so can't beat the price. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay, I'll go back a little bit here. I can get it to go back. I can use the pen. Okay. That'll be fine. I'll just step over here. Okay. So the whole goal behind doing the schools and land research was to make the better connection between um, our school location choices, how it's affecting urban sprawl, how um, our development of our communities, our planning and zoning laws, how they're affecting the school finances and school development. So really to make the connection and to try and encourage people to coordinate their plannings better. Um, schools aren't required to participate in local planning and zoning ordinances. They're allowed to pick their school location and build their development regardless of what's going on in the community. And community planners in, need to be involved in, uh, involved in that decision of where these schools are being located because they affect each other. And the whole point of this research was to make that economic connection to really show the numbers, the dollars, and say um, how important that it is that they actually work together and not live in a vacuum. And so this is just to give you an idea of part of the background behind it. Uh, obviously, everybody's seen the Michigan counties map, which is showing you know, the 83 counties across Michigan. Some of you may not have seen this Michigan ISD map. This is um, a map showing all of the intermediate school districts across the state of Michigan. Um, some of them, you know, obviously are larger than others, very irregular borders. They don't match up with county lines um, almost anywhere except for perhaps the uh, Marquette Alger ISD um, up in the UP is very similar to um, the Alger and Marquette um, county boundaries as well and the, the eastern part of the UP, but basically the eastern part of the, um, the UP is different than the rest of Michigan because they've had a lot of consolidations across um, school districts as well as intermediate school districts. Now these two you can kind of see. What I think is more interesting is the next slide, which is showing our, on the left-hand side, those are our intermediate school district boundaries, or our school district boundaries, I'm sorry, and on the right-hand side is our minor civil division boundaries. And so these are all the local units of decision-making for schools and communities um, that don't have to be connected to each other in any way. They're not required to plan in coordination. And once you add on the school districts and intermediate school district boundaries, you couldn't see what the map looked like if you tried to, to show it on one page. You couldn't see the lines or differentiate anything from each other. And they don't match up at all. I mean, you have some in the UP that are very similar to the minor civil division lines or county lines again. But down in the Detroit area, the Lansing region, the Grand Rapids region here, there's, there's complete overlapping of lines. Um, and 
different taxing authorities as well. So it's hard to make coordinated decisions um, with such a patchwork quilt appearance. So those are the reasons we got together. We looked at these maps. We were looking at how our schools are decided and decided, okay, we, we need to make this connection so people work together. We're not advocating that new laws be in place or that we change all these borders. What we're advocating for is that people are working together and that they're acknowledging that they have an effect on each other and that they need to be involved at the same time town meetings. They need to be involved at the same school board meetings um, when decisions for the community are being made. And we wanted to gain more information on what's going on in schools and the surrounding community. And so who should be interested in this? We should all be interested in this. Educators should be interested in this. Planners and zoners should be interested. Educators, environmentalists should be interested. Where our schools are located are having a large effect on urban sprawl. And so we need to be all concerned about where we're locating our schools as well as how our um, communities are being planned. In order to do this, we got together a large project team that was headed up by Dr. Soji Adelaja, the director of the Land Policy Institute, and Mark Wyckoff, the associate director. The project team included myself um, and then other staff members at the Land Policy Institute, Kyla Bowery, Chuck McEwen, Ben Kalin, and Michael Forsyth. And most of the team members have been on it since the very beginning, working on helping to develop the products and the tools and the research. But more importantly is the advisory team members that we have involved in this project. We have people from across the state helping to develop and guide this research, identify the key issues that needed to be addressed. And we have people from the University of Michigan, D Dick Norton, um, Joe Orn from Eastern Michigan. We have Dave Arson from the MSU College of Education at Michigan State University. Um, Bill Rustum from Public Sector Consultants and Doug Roberts from the Public Policy Research. There's more, I'm not going to read them all, but we have people from across campus, different departments, and across universities across Michigan to help guide this research and make sure that we're covering all the points that needed to be addressed that aren't addressed in typical education research. And so these were the five tenants that we identified as being the critical components to what we were looking at doing, relating schools to land. Um, first, we wanted to look at the institutional and financial analysis of Michigan schools. How are they funded? How are um, our laws encouraging or helping school construction? Um, school siting and location decisions. What laws are in place that are um, encouraging bad decisions or perhaps not in place that could be encouraging um, better decisions to be made? We wanted to look at the density impacts on state and local revenues. How are our population, our zoning ordinances, our communities, how are they affecting our school finances? And then also we wanted to look at impacts on traffic crashes with kids, more location issues, and safe routes to schools. Those other two um, we weren't able to do in this ori original project because of funding. So we tried to focus on the first three, and then hopefully with additional funding we can start going on to the, the next two, the safe routes to schools. So far we've completed um, two atlases, which I have here with me today. And that's what I'll be focusing most of my presentation on, is showing you the school's location atlases. Um, a book which will be out um, this summer. It's currently at MSU print for layout right now, and that's been completed. Um, that's edited by Rebecca Miles from Florida State University, and Dr. Soji Adelaja and Mark Wyckoff from the Land Policy Institute, and several reports. Um, I'll talk about one or two of the reports today if we have time. But I'm going to focus briefly on the Michigan Schools Location Atlases. Now, these were a large undertaking. It took several years to put these together. Um, primarily because we were trying to map exact locations of schools across the state of Michigan, every single school in the state. <coughs> and you'd think that you might be able to do that, but you try to get on the, the education websites and you try and look up addresses. And most of the schools put a district office, um, a headquarters, and that's the only address they have for all of the buildings in the district. And so to actually map each individual district, we had to compile about three different data sources, several mailing surveys, and a couple students' time all summer long to call around to school districts and try and find out the addresses. It would have been a lot easier if we were just doing one time period, but we wanted a historical record. So we started doing 1970, 80, 90, 2000, and 2006, and that's where it got a little hard <laughs> to do. We did do 1970 and 80, however, because of the large error rates with such old data, we're not showing change between 70 and 80 and 80 and 90s. But we are showing 90 to 2000 and 2000 to 2006, so we know where all of the buildings were and where they've changed. We estimate about a 3 to 5 percent error rate with our school location um, mapping on that. But what these do, the first atlas is the public schools location atlas. That's where I said we identified all of the, the school locations, actual points, um, graphically or geographically. 
Um, they all, they're for 92,000, 2006, and the change between those years. And it also shows enrollment information for those years. And then the Michigan Demographic Atlas takes a slew of population information and density, um, I'm sorry, uh, demographic information, and we show it not only at the county and MCD level, which many of you have seen before, but we also show it at the intermediate school district and school district level, so you can make comparisons. A lot of times your county may be doing something different than what's happening at your school district level. Um, the county may be losing population, but your school district may be gaining, or vice versa. So you can really get down lower, and then you can see the minor civil divisions that make you up. So you can see how your particular school district or your particular intermediate school district is changing in relation to the surrounding community, as well as in comparison to what's happening in other school districts that are similar to yourself. And for all of both of these atlases, we provide some information on um, some key observations, what's happening at the state or regional level. So just some important things to, to note. What these allow us to do is to visualize how your community has been changing over time, both at the minor civil division and county level, as well as the school district and ISD level, and place your community in a regional and statewide context for comparison purposes. It's also to help, uh, designed to help provide just fact-based information for communities to use, so that they have a baseline to make assessments from. Obviously, with the 2010 census coming out, we would love to do this again. We were only able to do it for 1990, and 2000 for the population information, and we would hope that we're able to receive funding to do an additional 10 years to 2010. So this is really providing you a baseline. Where have we been? Where are we at? So we can make decisions for the future. This is just a, kind of an outline of what is included in the atlas. It has an overview of the location of Michigan Public Schools, where schools have opened and closed, district enrollment um, at different levels, and charter school enrollment. And this is, uh, on the right-hand side would be an example of one of the maps just showing total schools and the state um, for 2006. And then I have some fast-backed information breaking down the number of schools by elementary, middle, high school, charter, and total. Um, we didn't have charter schools in 1990, so there's no information for that. We started those um, um, before 2000. 2000 was really the first year that we have actual data points for where our charter schools are located. And then down at the bottom has the change in number of public schools. As you can see, we decreased from 2000 to 2006 by 87 schools statewide. And then from 1990 to 2006, overall, we've increased. But we are on a, a decline um, in, the more, in more recent years. And this is just uh, an overview of the openings and closures, that net loss of 86 from 2000 to 2006. 2006 is the, the most recent year we have for school locations. The, as I said, this project was started about five years ago. Um, we collected data for the 2005 to 2006 school year for schools. Um, right now, the most recent available uh, information available on enrollment is only to 2008 at this point. 2009 information hasn't come out yet, and 2010 won't come out for another two years. So there's quite a lag between what's available for um, school enrollment, building, et cetera, information um, from the federal government because of the process time that it takes to involve. Here's some additional fa facts on school enrollment. Now what I've added to the right-hand side of that top left table um, is 2008 numbers for elementary, middle, and high school. The reason that there aren't any charter schools is because this process was actually really involved by going through in hand, looking at each individual school and identifying it as either a charter school or a non-charter school. We also pulled out all alternative education schools. And these enrollment numbers are just for kindergarten through 12th grade. They do not include pre-K or ungraded numbers. So it all had to be pretty much done by hand, looking through and making sure we're identifying um, a school that's really a school and, and not um, a different center. They, they don't always have different names. They're not always identified as an alternative education. They may sound like a regular school, so a little bit more investigation needed to go into that. So I can't do the change numbers for 2006 to 2008 because these were basically me getting online, looking through it, doing a quick overview, pulling out anything that said alternative education, but I didn't get to pull all of them out and I wasn't able to identify which ones are the charter schools. But the total should be um, approximately correct. We have had a decrease in enrollment overall in the state from 2006 to 2008. Um, I'll talk about Kent County a little bit more later because it, it particularly has had a loss in population. But so we have been on a decline. We had an increase from 1990 to 2000, and since then it's been slowly going down as with our state's population.
Um, sorry, this graph on the right isn't showing up. It should be the statewide view of the zoomed in section on the left. So probably not of interest to you anyway. You want to focus here on this part of the region. And this is just showing um, elementary school enrollment. Now the dots indicate a larger school. So each dot is one school, and the size of the dot indicates the size of the school. Um, we have them scaled up. Um, the information up at the top is just your average maximum, minimum, and median enrollment over the time periods, how that's changed. And this right here, here in the center of the map, I'm gonna point it out to you. This is the Kent County, or the Kent ISD, the Intermediate School District. And those are the school districts that make up the Kent ISD. Um, the largest one, of course, is the, where is it down there, the Grand Rapids, or the, Grand Rapids Public School District is by far the largest school district within this ISD. And I'll talk a little bit more about that district in a minute. Now these are just showing some of the enrollment change maps. I just chose a couple. I chose 1990 to 2006, just so you could see the overall change between those, that 16 year time period. Again, the dots are actual locations of the schools and the size of the dots is the um, relative size of the school. Now the, for these two time periods, the blue dots are the same um, denomination of uh, spans of um, number of enrollment. Um, so they go up, so they can, they're directly comparable to, from one to the other um, across these time periods. So you can see um, how the schools have grown out in the, I, w I would call them the first tier suburbs around the central city of Detroit, how, or central city of Grand Rapids, I apologize, um, how the schools have been growing on the, on the fringe. And this is the elementary schools. This is your middle schools. You can see the increase in red dots around Kent County. And then the high schools. Again, quite a large increase on the periphery of the schools around the urban centers. And this is very similar to what's happening in Lansing and in Detroit and Flint and Saginaw across the state. This is just to give you some information of where the Grand Rapids Public School Districts. Now, as a school, at a school district level, Grand Rapids was the only one to rank in the top five, bottom five of our statewide ranking. So it's really looking at most of our urban um, schools. It's not really focusing on the smaller scale schools, except for a couple examples. Um, in the total number of school buildings, Grand Rapids ranks second with 47 schools. That's second in the state. Um, with, by enrollment, it ranks fourth with 17,788 students. Now this is in 2006. And the change in number of school buildings, it has lost 10 schools compared to, um, that's second to Detroit, which lost 36 over the same time period. Um, most schools were right around zero of, of loss. That would be the average, uh, a gain or loss of one or two is, is pretty common. And by enrollment gains and losses, it is fifth with a loss of 3,817 students between 2000 and 2006. But much of the loss in the Grand Rapids School District has gone to its first tier suburbs. This is just, now the, the map on the right hand side is showing our charter schools. Those are done separately in this atlas. Um, they're identified differently um, because of their different focus. And again, the, the sizing is indicating um, the relative scale of the community. Overall, between 2000 and 2008, 30,000 people were lost from the Kent County. And of that, 6,000 or over 6,000 were lost in the last two, um, from 2006 to 2008. The Kent ISD overall in 2008 had approximately 80,000 students in K through 12 education, and the breakdown is below the K through 5, 6 through 8, and 9 through 12, which are what we called elementary, middle, and high school. The Michigan Demographic Atlas is a separate entity, which is basically, as I said before, showing minor civil division, county, um, ISD and school district demographic information across the state. These are the 16 chapters that are included, shows things like per capita income, race, total household, housing units, median home value, et cetera, at all the levels so that you can make comparisons across the, the units. This is an example of one of the comparison pages. We each, um, each individual map is its own page, so it's nice blown up so you can see what's going on. This is just an example of one of our comparison pages for the intermediate school districts highlighting which communities have lost in red and then which communities have gained population in blue. 
And again, this would change quite dramatically for the 2000 to 2010 period with the new census information. Overall, as a state, we've been losing population heavily in our urban areas. So this would probably turn much more red um, with the new census information that'll be coming out, hopefully um, soon. Unfortunately, the school district and ISD information won't be available until probably 2012 at the earliest, just because it takes so much longer to take the census information, process it into these geographic boundaries. This is some um, other information. Again, I, I've noted here that population has declined with Kent County alone losing 30,000 people from 2000 to 2008. Um, but it's really showing how the population has been changing from 90 to 2000. Um, so you can see where, where the movement is occurring, where people are sprawling to. The places that have lost population in, in this diagram have been continuing to lose population. They're still the areas with great, the greatest population loss, um, urban Detroit. Uh, Grand Rapids, Lansing, Flint, Saginaw. Some of the other research projects, the, the, that was the first stage of what we were trying to do, really to just get a baseline assessment. What's going on? What do we have? Where are we? How do we look forward? So that was our first stage in the process was to compile those atlases. So we had some information to build off of. And some of these other reports that we've um, built off of those atlases our municipal land use and financial viability of schools, which is really um, a case study of the Lansing region showing where our student population actually lives, relating them to their housing attributes, the number of bedrooms, the square footage of the home, all of the building attributes, and how is that affecting school finances. Our schools are financed um, two ways. First of all, through the state school aid fund based on a per pupil count. So the more children you have in your community, the more money that's going to your public schools. And then the other side for the buildings, and um, those are based on property taxes. So how are your planning and zoning ordinances affecting what income is being brought into the schools? That was the question. We wanted to balance the two and see how um, it's affecting how schools are financed. Um, the structure and equity impacts on population change in schools, um, it was a, it's a, called the Gini coefficient ratio, which is looking at where are schools located in relation to different population characteristics. So, where, how are our schools distributed across races? How are they distributed across income? How are they distributed across age groups, social groups, things like that? We wanted to see how we are at um, placing our schools in our landscape. The implications of school location change for healthy communities in a slow growth state really focuses on Michigan as a losing population state and how that is a different scenario than what's going on across the country. We are one of the only states in the entire nation that is losing population and has this issue. We gave this presentation on the implications at a Florida conference and everyone was blown away from across the country. They didn't even imagine that this could even be a problem that you have urban centers losing population. They're all struggling to try and find out where they can build enough buildings. And this was a new concept, so it was really interesting to, to have that discussion and engage in that dialogue. And then also the socioeconomic and demographic factors in the location distribution of schools. Um, the other product that we have is the School Siting and Healthy Communities Atlas, or Schools Book, um, which I will show you in a little bit here. I think I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to skip through. Um, this is just some information on the municipal land use, and I'll go right to the, to the conclusions, basically. Overall, what we found, um, th there were some, some interrelation between what was happening in the schools and the finances. And what we identified was that an optimal lot size did exist in the Lansing region of low 0.18 acres um, to optimize the finances going to the schools because of the two revenue sources, as I mentioned. It's just a case study. More research needs to be done. We need to expand that to multiple regions to, to get a better indication of exactly um, how zoning ordinances relate to school districts. But ultimately, what the point was, and what we really wanted to show, was that these two things are related, that planners and zoners and education officials really need to be talking about where schools are located, because how a community is planned and developed is really affecting the school's finances for the future. What's happening today, what, what is being planned for the future, is going to impact the number of students and the finances that are coming into the school because of the way we have our financing set up. And as well, the location of a school is really affecting what's happening in the community. If a school builds out in a farm field and it's not planned for for the development and the growth of that community, there's really going to be a negative impact on that community. So they really need to be working together. There is a relationship and they, they just need to, to be engaging in dialogue and acknowledging their, their joint impact on each other. And then this is the school citing book, which is now in press. Um, hopefully by the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, it will be out. Um, the 
MSU um, printing, MSU Press has it, and they're putting it together. Now this is a nationwide study, or a nationwide book. This isn't just a Michigan focus. And it's looking at um, travel choices between schools, locations, and how um, healthy the community is. So it's, it's a lot of travel choices, healthy impacts, location decisions. So how are our communities on our landscape affecting, how are our schools on our landscape affecting our communities, and how are our landscapes affecting our, the health of our schools? And so I, I, this will be on our website. I encourage you to check it out if you'd like some more information. And all of this stuff is on our website um, at landpolicy.msu.edu. Um, most of the reports are available. The school's book chapters won't be available till probably <coughs> a year after the book has been published so that we can hopefully get a little bit of sales out of it. Um, but all of the information is available or will be available shortly. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Yes. So, well, we would like to include um, private schools. It's a little bit more difficult. They're not required to do the same reporting, so it's harder to find a, um, a resource for that information. Um, they're not required to, so I, I, we would most likely have to do some sort of a survey. It would have to be on a volunteer basis. Um, that would be more difficult. Uh, some of the things that we had to, um, that aren't included in this are homeschooled children, so those aren't in here as well. Um, we were able to identify several homeschool locations as well as the number of homeschool children, um, but there's no, you know, obviously most of them are taught out of their own home, so there, there's no way you can really look at that. Um, but we would like to include it. They're, they're not included in this version. You mentioned something that's going to be happening today. Is that on the website? Is that on the website? Yes, it is on our land policy website. Um, is, is there a special time that you have to tune in, or can you? It, it's 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 a um, it's a training seminar. I'm trying to think of where it is located. In this room. It's in this room. Okay, it'll be right here. <laughs> One o'clock, and it's free to, to come. Please, you know, if you'd like to, there'll be registration at the door. You're welcome to show up and register yeah. right then. I don't believe that this location is full for today. I believe it's got enough room if anybody would like to attend. It is two hours. It'll be prim primary, primarily a lecture format, um, but you'll be provided with a lot of information. Everything is free, and um, there'll be handouts that you can download for free off of the web, or you can purchase them on site. It's about a 140 slide presentation. It's really going over what's happening with our new economy growth. Um, it's called the Prosperity Initiative, and it's a prosperity training um, where we're going to be going through the old economic development, new economic development, how things are different, what assets we need to be looking at at our regions, um, what barriers are in place as far as mindset issues, and how we can move forward. And it's really setting the stage for our um, 201 and 301 training programs, which are really workshops, getting people together, looking at regional assets, and, and trying to, to make strategic decisions for our region and, and build coalition um, support to, to grow our economy in a sustainable way. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think when um, you're talking mostly about new schools being built, but um, are you looking at all at school closures? And what Absolutely. Really is the effect it has on a neighborhood. Because a neighborhood school, such a neighborhood elementary school, is so important to that area. And is that factored in any way, the quality of life, the neighborhood, or anything? That, uh, we, we do focus on um, school closures. We have a, an entire chapter that's developed to where schools are, are closing in a community. Um, a lot of the in-depth um, community profiling work has been done by uh, some of our um, research partners. So we ourselves didn't go in depth into the, the psychological effect. We mentioned things like, you know, uh, the biggest reason that school districts don't want to consolidate to an ISD level is because you don't want to lose your football team, your community um, center, your community identity. So that's a lot of the reason behind um, school consolidation issues. And, and it's a real issue. It's, it's a real concern to lose your community school and to lose your, your identity where you went to high school. Um, it's related to funding. People are less likely to vote for a tax referendum to support all of the schools in the region as opposed to their school. Um, of course, in some regions, people don't want to support their schools either, so <laughs> maybe it would help those areas out. But we weren't, um, we didn't focus specifically on um, the social impact and the psychological impact. Um, we relied on other people's research for that portion. And that's one of the areas that plays a larger role when we start talking 
about our um, healthy community side, which is our, I think our fifth tenant that we want to discuss <laughs> later with, with additional funding. <laughs> There, we, we, we discussed them in the report um, that's talking about uh, migration of students across Michigan. And we began doing some case studies of some communities that have a large school of choice issue. The enrollment choices um, will be shown. If you, from the 2000 to 2006, you can see some enrollment shifts. And some of those are going to be based on school of choice because we're looking at the enrollment of the actual school, not necessarily where the people lived who went to that school. So you, you have seen a larger um, drain from a lot of our urban communities, especially with the growth of the charter schools. Um, the charter school enrollment has grown up dramatically over the 2000 to 2006 time period, and a lot of that is due to school of choice and people leaving primarily urban schools and going to, to the charter schools. Um, we haven't gotten into that at this point yet, um, but we have, like I said, mostly talking about anecdotal information of what, what studies have shown regarding that. They're included in our, our literature views about how, how it affects the psychological well-being of the community. Um, but no, we haven't. I know you've talked about how this is tied to you know, municipal land use decisions and zoning decisions, but if you flip that, how do you hope this research will be used by school districts? Mm -hmm. Well, we're really hoping to, to make that connection so that planners and zoners and community officials jump on the school boards and get involved with the school decisions, um, you know, participate at more meetings, know what's going on. You know, a lot of times um, planners and zoners aren't told until a school decision has been made. The school board comes to the local community and says, here's our plan. We've already approved it with higher ups in education. Here's where our school's going to be located. The farmer already donated the land. It's a done deal. So we want um, community members and planners and city officials to get involved earlier on so that they're not surprised and blindsided by all of a sudden the school making a decision so that there's, there's some dialogue ahead of time continually throughout. So when, when the first discussion is made about revamping a school or building a new school, that the officials are already there at the meeting um, and can be involved at, at the very beginning. Yes? Um, when we fund schools, a large chunk of it based on profit, correct? Mm -hmm. Effective for so counteracting or? We haven't investigated what a better way to fund schools were. We were working within the so current operating system. system. But it, it's interesting to note when, you, when you're talking about the disparity, one of the things that we were looking at with one of our distribution of schools um, is the, we focused on Detroit with the large population loss, but the large number of schools and quite honestly, how burdened Detroit is based on their property base compared to the surrounding communities with the number of buildings. They, don't, they can't afford to build a new school or to even, you know, they, they talk about closing down schools, but they can't afford to build the schools like the Taj Mahals we see in the suburban areas that are really attracting students and providing a quality education environment. Um, they're kind of stuck with what they have and they don't have the funding resources to do anything differently. And so some of our research is just showing how because of the way our schools are funded, we're really leaving some communities out to dry. Yes, they have the per pupil funding, but they don't have the facilities funding that they may need to, to turn their school districts around or to encourage increased participation at the schools. And so that was something that we, we really thought was very interesting and very powerful, and we wrote a small report on that, and that's included in the school's book. Absolutely. Across the street from the elementary school, and it takes me, 
I just gotta wait for the traffic to cross the to street cross. or uh, wait for a one lane street. Mm -hmm. I don't see my next door neighbor drive across the street, <laughs> drop their trip, <laughs> and then uh, come back to their house, not even you know, continue on. <laughs> how do you get, um, do you have anything that addresses, you know, how to, how to get people to get their kids a little bit more independent? And then it, it, I mean, it's, it's a structural change that's been, it's, it's really a structural change that's been going on for decades. Um, I'm trying to identify which author it is that wrote specifically on that issue. Um, I think it's the travel mode choice chapter. We've got actually a couple chapters in, the, in this book that are addressing that particular issue and it's really going through the history of how people have changed their, their movement patterns and how it, certain communities are basically self-selecting for walkable communities. And so you're seeing people that want to make their children walk to school or are gonna force their kids not to be able to drive until they're, they're 18 or ever. And you're seeing communities and people selecting communities that have a walkable school district and moving to those areas. And it really is a mindset issue. And, and some of it's a safety issue because um, in a lot of the urban school districts, they're talking about issues of Yes, the school's only two blocks away, and yes, it looks like a nice area, but there's also some, you know, activities going on in the region that make me uh, feel unsafe to let my child walk those two blocks to school. So you've got some issues, but a lot of it is going to be overall mindset issues because we, we've grown up being driven to school. I, I lived a mile from school. I never walked to school. I mean, I wish I did. I, you know. That's the best part of the day for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that I think that's a stronger mindset issue of us as people overall. I don't think it's something that a school individually can you fix. Have you out an for no, no. <laughs> I wish we did. I, I, I'd love to tell you we, we can solve all the mindset issues. I really do think that the, that's part of our more um, structural issue as a state and an overall mindset issue. And it's not something the schools can fix, and it's not something the communities can fix. It's something that they have to fix together and we as a region need to fix it. It's got to be public education. It's got to be more um, information to the health benefits of walking, the, you know, m making it more accessible, making it more easy, making it more appealing to people because I just don't think that they, people are, are seeing it as a viable option. Everybody's so busy. You think it's quicker to walk your ki or drive your kids to school, but it may not be. So, especially with the traffic problems with, with schools. And then we also have the issue of uh, a lot of schools not being able to walk as they move out into farm fields on, on the suburban areas or the rural areas, further and further away from the schools where you can't even walk. And it's unsafe to walk. Um, we have a lot of studies that are showing that those schools that are being placed out, kids that try to walk have higher rates of traffic crashes with cars. You know, they get hit more often. So there's a safety issue that comes into play that we need to be acknowledging, particularly when we're choosing our school locations and whether we're going to tear down a school or rebuild a school. Absolutely, and I, I don't mean to say that it's about $7,200 has gone down recently with the funding cut, so it's probably more at about 7000 per pupil is the funding. I'm not trying to say that that's the best amount that we should be paying per pupil for our students across the state either. That's the current amount. It's just more equal than the tax base revenues is all I'm, tr I'm trying to say with that. I don't think that it is probably as um, adequate as some people would like. There are some adjustments made for um, uh, the special education children, that's done at the ISD level. So each individual intermediate school district is given funding for special education um, by per pupil as well as for um, faculty. And they're required at the intermediate school district level to provide special services for districts. Um, wh whether it's adequate or not per, per intermediate school district or per, per district, I, cou I couldn't say right now. 
I think that's all the time. I've, I've probably gone a lot further than I should have. If anybody has any more questions, I'll be happy to answer them over here or talk to you about more. Um, if you'd like to take a look at what the atlases look like, I've got some examples up here of what, what we've put together for our school's location and our demographic atlases. So if anybody wants more information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.